Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to VRX, How Virtual Therapeutics Will Revolutionize Medicine. I'm Brennan Spiegel, and I'm the Director of Health Services Research here at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And on behalf of our virtual reality program and our VR research team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, where for the next two hours, we'll be exploring a new field of medicine. This is a field that the FDA now acknowledges and calls medical extended reality, or MXR. And we're going to be learning about what MXR is and how virtual reality is teaching us about our own consciousness, about how our mind and body are connected, and how we can use this new technology, which is really an old technology, but now being used on the front lines of medicine to engage our patients in new and different ways and to augment traditional therapies in medical delivery. Now today also is the release date of the new book, uh, VRX, uh, which is a book that I wrote uh, that tells the stories of our own research at Cedar sinai using virtual reality in patient care. And it also tells the frontline stories of patients and researchers and doctors around the world who are using virtual reality to take care of some of the most difficult to treat conditions in all of medicine. And today we're going to hear from several of the researchers and the patients uh, who are featured in VRX. And I'm so excited to have them today to tell their own stories, which I tell in the book as well. So we're gonna get started uh, with my own slides uh, to sort of kick us off here. And before we get too far, I just want to thank our supporters especially Cedar sinai Medical Center, which is behind me, without whom this would not be possible, and the leadership at Cedar sinai our virtual medicine program at Cedar sinai and special thanks to Applied VR and Confidio for their support of today's webinar. They're helping to bring this to you in this YouTube premiere event. Now, before we get too far, if you have questions during this event, you can type them in to uh, the comment box and our members of our team will uh, try to get to you and answer those questions as they arise. Now here is an overview of some of the speakers who we'll be hearing from today. As I said, these are esteemed uh, physicians and researchers and patient partners uh, who are featured, many of whom in the book and who will be telling their stories and describing how they're using virtual reality to help manage a wide range of different conditions or have used virtual reality to manage their, their own conditions. This is a cover of the book, as I showed you already, VRX. And if you're interested in picking up a copy, there is a QR code that you can scan that is linked to today's webinar. And you can also buy it wherever books are sold. Special thanks to Basic Books for publishing this book. Uh, in helping to tell the stories of medical extended reality so the rest of the world can learn about this new and exciting field of medicine. So I wanna give an overview of what we'll be hearing about today. I'm going to give the first talk, but the second talk will be from Raphael Grossman, who is honorary faculty at Singularity University and a world-renowned technologist and a surgeon. He was the first surgeon to use Google Glass in the OR and since then he has used VR in the OR and a wide variety of other technologies. And he'll be telling you about how he's using these different mixed reality technologies in his clinical practice and provide some projections for the future where this field is headed. Then we're going to hear from Danielle Collins, uh, one of our patient partners who will give an extraordinary talk about how she saw her brain and how it changed her life at a very vulnerable moment in her life. And I tell her story in the book, but uh, nothing better than hearing it from herself. And we'll be learning about how she used virtual reality and how she has now gone on to champion virtual reality for a right, wide range of conditions. We're then gonna go on and have some panels. The first panel will be uh, on the neuropsychology of virtual reality. This will be chaired by Dr. Itai Danovich our chairman of psychiatry at Cedar sinai and will feature these three researchers, Judy Pa from USC, um, Nanthia Sufana from UCLA, and Professor Skip Rizzo, also from USC. 
And these three researchers have been using virtual reality for years to uh, help manage and understand a wide variety of neuropsychological conditions, everything from Alzheimer's disease to post-traumatic stress disorder. And we'll hear a bit about their research and how they're using virtual reality and leveraging its perspective taking capabilities to help manage these very difficult conditions. Then we'll be hearing from patient partners, these three patients, and we'll introduce them in a little bit. This will be chaired by uh, Dr. Brandon Burkhead from our group at Cedar sinai and Matthew Stout from Applied VR, and we'll be hearing their perspective of how they have used virtual reality in their own care. So I'd like to get started with my part of the webinar, returning to the cover of the book VRX. I titled it VRX because if virtual reality is a therapy, then we need a VR pharmacy. And we've been learning about all the different ways that virtual reality can help manage patients, the different mechanisms by which it works. And we've also been talking with our patients over the past five years, learning from them and finding out how they interact with this technology. And where do they want to go? What fantastical destinations? If, for example, they're in a hospital room and need to uh, explore other worlds instead of feeling like they're in the hospital. And we've learned a lot from our patients and we've used virtual reality now in over 3,000 patients at Cedar sinai Medical Center. And we learned something from every single one of our patients. So I can show you lots of data and research studies and I'll show you some, but there's really no substitute from just hearing from our patients. And I'd like to share with you a couple of our patients right here, all of whom have been very gracious to allow us to show their image and tell their stories, some of whom I describe in the book. With the music and everything, it's real peaceful. Oh, it's people. Hey. Oh, cool. So what'd you think? It's, really, it's pretty relaxing. Uh-huh. Especially with the music and everything, and then the different scenery, like, it was this one part where it was um, like a waterfall, you're sitting in a cave, right. and it's a waterfall right next to you. Almost made me forget I was here, like, like because you're there. Right. It's like <clears throat> you're really there, you're hearing the waterfall, and everything is like, you look around, and it's the whole scenery. Right. It's like you're immersed in it. There can be a new form of pain management and pain treatment if you, you know, we continue in the right path. The breeze is blowing through. I'm sitting at the top of Kinnathon, and there's downtown. There's the Hollywood sign. And there's my house. <laughs> this, is, this is just surreal. The sun is beaming down on me. Like, I almost feel like I can feel the rays. Oh, man. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a tech guy, and I'm a young techie, but I never thought technology would come this far as far as health is concerned. Not in my lifetime. And I also never imagined that technology would be used like this in healthcare until we started to explore and learn. And we started to hear from our patients. We realized we needed to start studying this ourselves and using virtual reality to learn more about it. Now, these are a couple of the different types of headsets that we work with. These are two of the companies we work with, uh, Oculus and Pico. And we've used other headsets like the Samsung Gear VR. And these technologies now are available in the past um, people have used virtual reality in psychology laboratories and elite universities, but until recently, we haven't had these very effective, high quality and affordable headsets also that we can clean um, to use on the front lines of healthcare. And since we have these new technologies, we're taking this research that's been accumulated over years and bringing it to the front lines. Now, before I talk about the treatment opportunities, I also just want to briefly talk about the educational opportunities in healthcare for using virtual reality. You know, right now I'm giving a very traditional talk. I'm using PowerPoint slides, but PowerPoint is two dimensional. The world is three dimensional. What if we could actually walk right into slides? What if I could use virtual reality to engage with my students and actually show them what bacteria look like right in the slide itself. And that's exactly what I was able to do here in a talk that I gave using software developed by Confidio, a very innovative company that is allowing very different types of modern virtual reality learning using these live stage mixed reality platforms. And you know, on the right is another example of a talk that I've given 
where I'm in virtual reality and I'm engaging with these different images and able to engage with them and show the audience these rather complex concepts that if they were shown on a two-dimensional screen or in a textbook might be difficult to, to uh, understand, but when shown in this three-dimensional space, in this case, I'm talking about the brain gut axis and how the brain and the gut communicate along the spinal cord. And I can go right into the body and engage the spinal cord and even peel it apart and look right at it and point out key attributes and physical characteristics of how pain is moving up and down the spinal cord. Now on the bottom right is yet another opportunity for using, in this case, augmented reality or AR, where an expert um, can walk right up onto your literal desktop and he or she can engage you about some kind of topic and do a lecture right there in front of you. Now this happens to be uh, Mike Moret from Confidio who is showing his own software and discussing how the data shows that it really engages learners in a very different way. So this is modern virtual reality three-dimensional learning and although I'm giving this talk in two dimensions, the world is three-dimensional. Now, the first time that I ever used virtual reality was about six years ago, and you're looking at a picture of what I saw. And some of you have heard this story before, uh, but many of the people on today's webinar have not heard the story or have not even used virtual reality. And I didn't know what VR was. It was something that you know kids maybe used for games, but I hadn't really imagined how it could be used in healthcare until uh, Professor Walter Greenlee from Stanford came to my lab and he put a headset on my face and all of a sudden I'm standing on a window washer rig going up the side of a 50-story building and this is literally what I saw and I've turned the sound down but I could hear the sound of creaking cables. I can hear the wind. I can look around and feel this teetering platform that I was on. And I'm a little bit afraid of heights, but at least I felt secure with that railing in front of me. So I was able to look around and take in some of the details like that rotary down there and the cars going around, the dents in that metallic bar in front of me. And I was just starting to feel comfortable when all of a sudden that railing just falls off the window washer rig and it plummets 50 stories to that hard concrete surface down below. And I can literally hear it clank as it hits that. And then they told me, just go ahead and jump off the building. And I said, no chance. I'm not going to do that. And they said, well, you know that your feet are standing on carpet, right? I mean, I was in a conference room and there was a whiteboard behind me. And I said, well, you know, I know that like intellectually, but my body is unable to disambiguate standing in this virtual world and being in a conference room at the same time. And so we'll just jump off. And I was able to do it. It took all this courage and I jumped 50 stories and the wind was blasting through my ears and I landed and I hit the ground. And that's the first time that I used virtual reality. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this technology, it overcame me. It hijacked my brain. This was not just an emotional experience. This was a full body experience. And I thought if virtual reality can be used for evil, then surely we can use it for good. And it turns out for years, people have been using it for good. And for the six years since this time, I've been exploring and learning how we can take advantage or leverage this capacity to help improve positive cognitions rather than scaring people to death, literally jumping off of buildings. Now, this is the first time that I died in virtual reality. And now I want to tell the story of the second time that I died in virtual reality. It was at the University of Barcelona, where I visited the laboratory of Professor Mel Slater. And Professor Slater has been studying virtual reality for good for many years. And I start my book, VRX, by telling the story that I'm about to tell you now, where he put me into this room in his laboratory, a rather nondescript kind of dark room with these black curtains. There's a chair and there's a coffee table in the middle. And they asked me to sit down on that chair and kick my feet up on the coffee table. And this is, uh, one of uh, Professor Slater's postdocs, Ramon Oliva, who is handing me a headset and he put vibration motors on my wrists and on my ankles and he put the headset on and this is the first thing that I see. All of a sudden, that room has been replaced uh, by this scene 
which is a living room that looks really quite beautiful. And it has this wood paneling and there's a chandelier on the ceiling. And I can see my feet in front of me on that coffee table. And then they asked me to start moving my feet around on the coffee table. And as I did that, I was able to see these blue lines that they drew and they asked me to trace those lines with my legs and I did it. I started to realize like, whose legs are those? I mean, they look like my legs, they move like my legs, they're in the same place as my legs, so they must be my legs. But I also realized that somewhere in that room, there was a computer running thousands of lines of code, convincing my brain into thinking that that was actually my body, that those legs were mine, but those, that's a digital doppelganger. That's of course non-existent, those legs, that's occurring in this virtual world. Now, the next thing that they did is they dropped these balls from the ceiling. At least they look like balls. They're digital spheres, but they came from the ceiling. And each time it hit my body, I could literally feel it in real reality because I would feel a little vibration in my body in the cat suit that I was wearing. And it was a perfect one-to-one -one synchrony. And at this point, I had what Slater calls sort of full embodiment or full body ownership. I believed that that was my body. Now what happened next is hard for me to put into words. It's sort of indelible. It's hard to describe in English, but I'm going to show it to you and I'm going to do my best to describe it as I do in the book as well. What happened next is all of a sudden I started to move back. And I mean my, my self, my thinking self, suddenly detached from this body and started to float back and up into the ceiling. Those balls followed me and I continued to feel them, but I looked down and I saw a motionless body that I had just occupied. And now it appeared vacant. It appeared motionless. My body was in motion, but that body was not. That body was still. I had died. I had just had a complete out of body experience. And somehow this computer with digital sleight of hand had violated something as essential as my physical coordinates in space and had caused me to believe that I had vacated my physical body. So I started to think to myself, what does this mean about my consciousness that a computer can so easily fool me into having this out-of-body experience? And moreover, I had this sense that I really had died, but it wasn't catastrophic. It wasn't, it was actually more mystical, almost spiritual. And it turns out Professor Slater has repeated this experiment many times in this study he published called A Virtual Out-of-Body Experience Reduces Fear of Death. He found that when people were randomized to this experience compared to another experience where they continue to move that body, and they checked in a week later, they found that people feared death just a little bit less. And I can tell you personally that I also fear death a little bit less having gone through this experience. Now, I don't wanna die, don't get me wrong, but I can say that somehow by going through this virtual reality experience, I have a durable cognition that death need not be catastrophic. And it's changed ever so slightly my perception of the actual process of passing away. And that is profound. And what it points out is that virtual reality is a tool that modifies perception. And if it's used to recalibrate unhealthy perceptions, perceptions of the world around us, perceptions of the world within us, then VR can become a radical new therapy to improve quality of life if used together with other traditional therapies. So, of course, there are other ways to change perceptions of the world. Meditation is an increasingly popular way, mindful meditation, to establish what's called non-dual consciousness, meaning you become essentially one with the world around you by inhibiting the ruminating mind within us, the mind that plans and schemes and thinks that projects into the future and lives in the past, but doesn't necessarily experience the power of now. That is one approach to radically change our perception of the world. Another way is through pharmacology. The medications 
or in this case, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Psilocybin is a psychedelic that also can inhibit the ruminating mind. So I bring this up because one question is, can VR be like a cyberdelic that inhibits the ruminating mind as well through its power of perception changing? And it turns out this has been looked at. In fact, this is one study that directly compared a form of virtual reality that you're seeing in this image directly against a psychedelic, psilocybin. And in this study from Neil Seth and colleagues from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom, they randomized people to either experience this bizarre world through this mixed reality platform where there were people walking by with bells and dog heads and shimmering Dali-esque surfaces around them, or they used psilocybin, the magic mushroom. And then they asked both groups to describe afterwards what their experience was like using a standardized altered states of consciousness questionnaire. And here you're seeing the results in the form of a radar diagram where they're comparing both uh, groups across these different domains of altered consciousness. And the thing that stands out is both lines are nearly superimposable. The experience or the so-called phenomenology of being in the cyberdelic versus the psychedelic, here called a hallucination machine at the bottom, were nearly the same, suggesting that VR can act almost like a psychedelic and inhibit the ruminating mind. Now we've been leveraging this power of VR to inhibit the ruminating mind using software like this for, to help people both in the hospital and outside the hospital who may have anxiety or who may need to take a break from their ruminating mind. This is software created by Trip VR, which is specifically designed to help entrain the brain into a so-called flow state. A flow state, which is essentially a state where you're thinking without thinking, where the brain, uh, the, the ruminating mind is inhibited and the rest of the brain can start to make lateral connections. It's almost like if you invite the conductor of an orchestra to leave for a few minutes, then the rest of the orchestra can have jam sessions. And you know, they may have cacophonous music, which is a bad trip, or maybe beautiful creative music, sort of a good trip. And that's the goal here is to have a good trip, of course. So VR has this ability to counteract the ruminating mind, and that may have benefits for anxiety, for depression, for phobias. And we'll hear more about that today as well. And the goal of all of this, whether it's meditation, medication, uh, psychedelics or cyberdelics, is to get some headspace away from your own overheated, overthinking mind. Now, I want to give you an example of another way of achieving some headspace. And what I'm doing here is I'm back in Professor Slater's lab at the University of Barcelona, where they are taking photos of me in order to create an avatar of my body and then put that avatar into a virtual reality world. And then what you're going to see in a moment is a very bizarre form of talk therapy where I'm able to get some headspace from my own head. So once they did this, they put me in this virtual world. And what you're looking at here is my first person view of my hands sitting at a table across from somebody else who you can't quite see yet. I'll show him in a moment, but I'll tell you right now that his name is Daniel Dennett. And some of you may know Professor Dennett. He's a famous philosopher at Tufts University. He's well known for his TED Talks. And uh, he happened to be one of my mentors when I was a philosophy major as an undergraduate at Tufts University many years ago. And we used to have debates in class about the existence of God. And uh, what we're about to have here is uh, a simulation of one of those debates. So let me show you what happens. Now look in the mirror to your left. When the light next to you turns green, explain the challenge to the person in front of you using your own words. How can I explain consciousness without invoking a god? Why do you need to invoke a god? I don't understand why that even matters. Uh... 
it's hard to explain otherwise how what seems like an immaterial experience can be conveyed through material substance. Well, that's a classic uh, dualistic concept that the mind and the body are separate and distinct, but there's no reason to invoke an immaterial component to our consciousness in the first place. So sort of a false premise. And on and on we go back and forth. So I'm just showing you a bit of the video and I tell this story in the book and I have a link in the book to the full video of our virtual back and forth. But once again, I'm losing to Professor Dennett. He's arguing me down about the existence of God. And, you know, as you're watching this, you may be wondering, how is it that he can respond so fluidly to my comments? Is this some kind of artificial intelligence or something? Well, it turns out there's no AI whatsoever behind his avatar. It turns out I'm not showing you the full story here. What happens is after I speak, I am next put into his body. I am transported directly into Professor Dennett's avatar, and I look across the table through his eyes, through his ears, through his body, and I see me across the table. I then need to summon his voice. I need to summon what is it that he would have said to me, and then I need to respond. And it's been over 20 years, and, I have, and it's as if the VR tapped into this latent part of my mind and made it manifest. I was able to, like a ventriloquist, summon his words and speak right back to me the way we did years and years ago. So that is me arguing with me, except that my voice sounds like his. The computer has permuted my voice to sound like Daniel Dennett's voice, but I'm just arguing with myself in this twisted, strange, bizarre, ego-busting virtual reality exchange. I'm literally getting headspace from myself by transporting myself into another body. Now that's another use of virtual reality, and it turns out it's being used to help manage anxiety and depression. The study at the top is entitled Conversations Between Self and Self, as Sigmund Freud. This is a study also by Mel Slater and colleagues at the University of Barcelona, where he shows that you can have your own form of self-therapy. In the bottom study is a study by Skip Rizzo, who we'll hear from later, who is using virtual reality for another application in post-traumatic stress disorder. He uses it in a little bit of a different way, but what these both have in common is using virtual reality for mental health conditions like phobia, depression, and PTSD. Now, I wanna move on in my last part of my talk to discuss another opportunity for virtual reality, and that's for managing pain. And what you're looking at here is a famous study from Hunter Hoffman at the University of Washington, where he used virtual reality to help manage pain. And what you're seeing are uh, two scans using functional MRI brain scans in the same patient or the same research subject. And on the left, this research subject is experiencing pain. There's a thermal probe being placed on uh, the subject's foot. And uh, on the right is also experiencing pain, but is using virtual reality. You'll notice on the left that there are more signals in the brain than on the right. There's like a, a sort of a flame, almost like a little fire conflagration in the brain on the left. So it's not just that there are more signals on the left, it's the location of those signals. So for example, the location is both in the sensory cortex where the pain is felt and experienced, but also in the insula, also in the limbic system in the center of the brain where the emotional experience of pain occurs. So not only is there a reduction in the physical experience of pain intensity, but also the emotional experience of pain. And this is critical because we've known for a long time that there are two arrows of pain. It is Buddha who said that pain has two arrows. The first arrow is when the archer strikes you and it hurts, it just physically hurts. But the second arrow is the self-inflicted wound. This is where you look at the first arrow and you think, oh my God, I'm gonna die. This is the anxiety that comes from knowing that you've been injured, knowing that you're having pain. So 
it, it appears that virtual reality can tamp down both types of pain. In contrast to something like a narcotic or an opioid that might reduce the physical experience of pain, but may not do anything about the emotional experience of pain. And these are two studies that demonstrate the ability of virtual reality, not only to reduce the sensory experience of pain, but also the cognitive and the affective experience of pain. In both of these studies, patients are randomized between VR or no VR. On the left, a study from the University of Washington in people with severe burn injuries who are undergoing dressing changes, a very serious and painful experience. And on the right, from the University of Michigan, women undergoing childbirth. And on the left and on the right, you can see that those in VR had less pain. On the left, it's the black bar, and on the right, it's the white bar. But in both cases, virtual reality reduced the amount of pain, but also the time spent thinking about the pain and the unpleasantness of the pain. And curiously, people undergoing burn dressing changes had more fun when they were experiencing virtual reality in this study um, from University of Washington. This is a study that we recently published out of Cedar sinai led by Melissa Wong and Kim Gregory from our OBGYN department, where uh, women undergoing labor at Cedar sinai were randomized um, between a control condition or a Lamaze-style breathing intervention uh, where they used virtual reality. And you can see um, that on average, there were greater drops in pain score in the, groups, in the group that got virtual reality. We've also uh, looked at different types of pain throughout the hospital at Cedar sinai And this is a study where we randomized 140 hospitalized patients to two groups. One group got a library of different VR experiences that were develop developed by Applied VR. And the other group uh, was able to watch a health and wellness channel on the TV in their room. And when we compared the virtual reality to the TV, over the course of their hospital stay, we saw a larger drop in pain scores in the VR group versus the TV group. And importantly, in the patients with the greatest amount of pain, those with scores of eight, nine, or 10, we saw the largest drops in pain with VR versus the TV. This is some visualizations that we use uh, courtesy of Applied VR. And you can see how sophisticated and beautiful the graphics are becoming, and it achieves this psychological sense of presence, where the brain literally feels present within these environments. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is using virtual reality uh, for what we call ingestive behavior or just eating. And this is a um, study that I want to show you from the University of Tokyo that uh, shows how the perspective changing ability of VR and other mixed reality platforms can change what we perceive to be real and that can affect how much we eat. So what you're looking at is an Oreo cookie and using this VR, it can make the cookie look larger or the cookie can look smaller. And it turns out that has implications for how much people are willing to eat. This is a research subject who's asked to eat as many cookies as he can and they look like a normal sized cookie. And he gets full after 11 Oreo cookies, which is quite a lot. The next day he comes back and the cookie looks bigger it's the same size cookie, but now after seven cookies, he can't eat anymore, he's full. And it just shows that perception becomes reality. And so this is one way to think about how to alter our perception of how much we eat. There are other ways to manage uh, eating disorders. And this is a research study from Giuseppe Riva from Italy, who's been using VR for both obesity and for anorexia. And in this instance, he's using it for obesity, where he uses virtual reality and patients use it and then they can see in their vision a normal sized avatar and they become this normal sized avatar. And it literally changes their view of their own body and their own cognitions about their own body. And in a randomized trial, Professor Riva was able to show that patients who were in this VR avatar therapy, when combined with cognitive behavioral therapy, had greater weight loss a year later compared to those who were not exposed to the virtual reality. So if I had another couple of days, I can talk about all of these other opportunities for virtual reality. I talked about some of them today, and there's so many more 
Um, and we'll hear a little bit more about some of these um, as the rest of this goes on. But as I said at the beginning, if VR is a therapy, then we need a VR pharmacy. And the Food and Drug Administration, the US FDA, US FDA now acknowledges this field and calls it medical extended reality. This is an infographic from a workshop that they held just before the pandemic when we all met uh, at FDA. I was very fortunate to be a part of this uh, workshop to start exploring the regulatory landscape around these burgeoning new therapeutics. We have a website if you'd like to learn more. It's virtualmedicine.health. It's also virtualmedicine.org. On this website, we post our latest research studies, uh, videos of all of our previous conferences, so you can hear from other, other people on this topic, videos of our patients, and um, all of our webinars are located here. And finally, as I said, um, we now have the new book, VRX. Again, thank you to Basic Books for making this available to the world to see. And once again, there's the, the QR uh, if you'd like to uh, read more about the stories that I told you today um, and many, many others uh, in this book, VRX. So with that, um, because I come from Hollywood, I want to end with credits. There are so many people at Cedar sinai who participated in the research that I showed you today. We have uh, many collaborators, uh, our own research group, collaborators from within and outside of Cedar sinai a number of students and trainees who have participated in this research, and I want to give special thanks to people at Cedar sinai including the leadership at Cedar sinai for supporting our virtual reality research and uh, making it all possible. If you'd like to follow me on, on social media, uh, that's my handle on Twitter, where I frequently tweet about um, uh, virtual reality and medicine, and our virtual medicine conference uh, um, handle is there as well. So I'd like to get us moving along to the next speaker, who is Professor uh, Rafael Grossman, uh, Singularity University. He's also a surgeon uh, in Maine, and he is, as I said before, the first surgeon to use Google Glass in the operating room. He uses MR, uses VR. He's going to give us a forward-thinking talk about the future of medical extended reality, everything from contact lenses that use augmented reality right on our eyeballs to other forms of technology that can expand our ability to take care of patients. So I'd like to, uh, without further ado, introduce Raphael Grossman, who is in his hospital over in Maine. Raphael, take it away. Hi, Brennan. It's a pleasure to be here. Congrats on this uh, third edition of this amazing conference. And also, of course, uh, congratulations on your uh, uh, incredible book. I can't wait to read it again. So with this, uh, let's uh, start. And uh, I'll uh, hope uh, that uh, you uh, will be thrilled. We are in the midst of a true revolution, a revolution ongoing for the last few decades. Computers that used to fill up a room and have very little power to computers now that fit on a ring, on a watch, on a View6 blade device, or obviously on a smartphone that we all carry in our pockets. When we think about exponential technology, we have to take into account Roy Amara's law. We tend to overestimate technology in the short run, and we tend to underestimate technology in the long run. And that is because our thinking is linear, but technology develops exponentially. So it is very important that when you are imagining or strategizing or planning, designing for the future, you keep into account Amara's law, because otherwise you will uh, likely uh, be wrong. So uh, it is an interesting concept that I wanted to, to share with you, especially with this presentation that is talking about the future of VR. I love science fiction, and I think that Hollywood predicts the future in very pre predictable ways. Remember Real Player One, about a year and a half ago, it showed for the first time across the street from Cedar sinai in LA, and people thought the movie was science fiction. What is not? We have the technology today to really, really do almost everything that uh, you can see in that picture. From a, a, a pilots that live uh, the simulation of flying a plane to a, 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 a doctors and future surgeons and actual surgeons who live the reality 
in a virtual way of operating and failing with a virtual patient rather than with a real patient. Fundamental VR is creating a, this type of a, 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 a platform in order to improve and perfect uh, how we learn and how we uh, teach. If you add to this a platform, the power of haptics, the power of uh, a, the a sense of touch, the feeling, a, a, the tactile feeling, a, then you go to a different level. You go to a level where a, the immersion is almost absolute. And if we think about AR and XR and the HoloLens 2 and how you can bring images into the operating room, into the procedure room, and the operator, the surgeon, can see those images in front of, 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 of her or of, of him, and uh, you can not distract yourself from the patient. Uh, then uh, the process of caring for the patient improves. Uh, from a learning with a, a digital tools to a, a also a diagnosing with digital tools and a, approaching the diagnosis uh, uh, the interaction with those diagnostic uh, tools in a different way to treating patients uh, uh, with uh, extended reality. Uh, the future is really here uh, today. I think within the next 10 years, this will be uh, very, very common in the operating room. You have companies, uh, for example, uh, like uh, Brain Lab, which uh, is a, a, a pairing with a mighty a Magic Leap device. And uh, a, a Brain Lab uh, is a, a very well-known surgical navigation platform all over the world and uh, when you see what they're doing with uh, the uh, 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 surgical viewer the digital viewer and uh, you can have a surgeon uh, look at the images in ways never thought possible before not in one two or three axes but in any axis possible I think that uh, now you are definitely redefining the paradigm of interacting with a, a, with a radiologic uh, imaging. It is all about interaction. It is all about spatial computing, interaction, and that is where the future is definitely going to go. And if you add physiologic variables, companies like iMotions, for example, which I did this with the Vario headset and iMotion sensor, galvanic skin resistance and a, 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 a blood pressure, EKG, temperature monitoring, and you can see how the person is actually doing a, a, the procedure, how the performance is happening, not how you see it, but how your internal physiology sees it, then you can improve the performance to levels that were never thought possible before. Eye tracking and this measurement is definitely the future. And again, back to haptics, platforms like HaptX, which is one of a few haptic platforms out there. It's all in evolution, but we're going to very bulky sets like this one, to sets that are basically a glove and a glove almost imagine, I imagine a surgical glove that uh, you put on and you are in virtual reality, you're feeling everything as if you were present, as if you had been teleported. And if you add a suit like the Tesla suit, where you have the possibility of a feeling of sensing temperature, pressure, force, then you know you go to a completely different level. Imagine in therapy, in rehabilitation, in physical therapy, someone has pain and you put a suit on and you can live that a, 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 a sort of a progress through your disease and through your therapy and you can measure that. I think that that, that is a very, very a, a exciting when you talk about the use of a VR and a, a, a AR and XR in a, the a, a caring of uh, patients. And I obviously have to talk about the, the uh, pandemic, right? The pandemic elevated the way we connect a, a remote a, a connectivity and communication, telehealth, telemedicine has finally uh, become a reality, right? But this is even better. This is in virtual reality, an avatar that allows you to connect in real time, no matter the geography where you're in, and interact with digital images. This is Beam from IETHO, and uh, a, a eventually the avatar, a potentially you can think of a photovolumetric avatars which have a AI algorithms, and you can have a person uh, be anywhere, anytime, and have the right answers for patient, reaching that gap between the supply and the demand of uh, healthcare uh, providers, remembering that five billion people in the world probably don't have access to the healthcare that we take uh, every day for uh, granted. So this is very, very exciting. And I think that uh, at the end, you know, we have to think, uh, sit back and, and realize, you know, uh, you know, just a few 
years ago, we didn't even have the uh, iPhone uh, with us or any other smartphone. And now we're up to the iPhone 12 almost. So you have new devices like the uh, uh, Apple Watch that measures your EKG, your pulse, and uh, your pulse oximetry, for example. It is really, really exciting where we're going. And I think that we're still going to go farther very soon. InWith is a company that has a hydrogel, a contact lens with circuitry in there. The potential of that circuitry to be anything that you want, including AR or extended reality, is real and is something that is really, really a, a groundbreaking. And it will a, define the new platform that we're going to have on us. And I'll leave you with this movie clip from The Matrix. You have to choose. You take the blue pill or you take the red pill. I hope you take the red pill because we want to show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Rafael. That was, as always, a fantastic talk. It gave us a lot to think about, showed us lots of examples of how uh, VR and AR and MR are being used in the OR. Um, and as a surgeon, you have a real unique uh, perspective of that. So you're holding some glasses. Um, what, what is it that you've got in your hand? Well, these are my, these are my new favorite. These are the, uh, the View 6 Blade, which uh, this is not the new edition, uh, which is coming pretty soon. But uh, this is really sort of the ultimate uh, easy, lightweight uh, uh, form-wise is uh, phenomenal. And uh, the possibilities of this device uh, to uh, integrate AR and XR to the daily doings in the hospital uh, are pretty amazing. So, so yeah. We have a lot of people on the webinar who haven't really thought about these things. When you say integrate AR within your daily role in the hospital, like what are some examples? How, how would you actually use this as a surgeon or going through the, um, the hospital? Yeah, well, now it's a, it's a really not a part of the, the standard way we, 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 we live our daily lives at the hospital, you know, being clinicians. But, uh, a, you know, imagine projecting the EMR uh, alerts or, or looking at uh, images or basic data, not the same data that you get on a screen, but a partial data, the data that you need, let's say, to, to maybe round on the patient, you know, the vital signs, the eye eyes and nose, the, 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 what's the hemoglobin today, those little things that could be projected rather than you having to sit in a computer, you could have that data come to you instantaneously, maybe even synchronously as you approach the patient's room, for example. That's one sort of a, a, a imaginative a, a possibility, you know, for this type of glasses. I think that enables the use of the technology in a, in a smart way to do our clinical work and be more efficient and be able to focus on the patient more rather than separating us from the patient. You know, we can focus on the patient and in a way be more empathetic and, 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 and um, you know, paradoxically humanizing the way we, we interact with patients by using technology. Right, right. So in my talk, I, I spoke a lot about the therapeutic opportunities. And really what we're talking about here are the, is, is efficiency for healthcare providers uh, and also this idea of training healthcare providers um, and surgeons in particular to, to be even better. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how VR and, and mixed reality and augmented reality can be used for simulations. You touched on it in your talk. What are, what, what are you seeing that's really exciting to you? Well, I'll tell you, Brennan, it, it, it's, it's really a phenomenal a, a, a speed right now. The way that the VR, for example, has developed in the way of uh, representing a, a real you know, simulations that uh, will a, a, a train physicians or providers or students in, in, a, in a better way, it, it's just uh, incredible. And it must, it's not just the, the, the digital realm that looks a, a so a, a real. Uh, almost, I was using the Vario device in, in one of those clips that I showed. Uh, it's almost like looking through a window, you know, the, the definition, the high definition of the device is just unbelievable. And you have platforms like uh, Fundamental VR or, or there are many others, you know, also VR or, or whatnot. But, but uh, when you add to that, the possibility of, let's say, measuring a, a physiologic variables. A, a, I mentioned eye motions, measuring GSR, you know, the galvanic skin potentials and telling whether you are nervous or not, or you're comfortable or you're in the in the it, you know, when you do a procedure, uh, that will measure performance in training in a much uh, better way. And then when you go to a, a AR or XR or MXR, right, uh, then uh, you go from from education to, to diagnostics to then treatment. 
I think that uh, I believe I showed in my in my video uh, uh, at least briefly how you have this uh, almost a, a photo volumetric renderings of patients, and you could have a digital patient. It's not an avatar. It could be an avatar. It could be a digital avatar that looks real. But in this case, is photo volumetric renderings of patients with whatever pathology you want to program into them. Imagine a student uh, taking their 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 uh, their or advanced trauma life support courses or ACLS courses with a digital entity and interacting with the entity. And if you add haptics, and if you add a smell, you know, that I was uh, mentioning uh, OVR is a technology that you can plug this little chip in your, in your Oculus Quest and you get the smell of whatever rendering you're seeing. Uh, in, as a gastroenterologist, that could go both ways for me, I guess, but yeah. It could, it could, but imagine, imagine, the, the student who, who really has to feel how he really feels, or imagine even the patient who has to, you know, really immerse himself in what the, the, the room is going to be like or smell like, or uh, I think it is interesting. It's very interesting what's happening. Well, this points out that, you know, we talk about VR as an immersive experience, and it's not just the visuals. I mean, sure, you, you are, you know, visually in this world, and, and you know, that's, that's a, an important sense, a, a major sense for our brain. Yeah. Uh, but we also can hear things, we can touch things, we can literally smell things. And as you discussed in your talk, that there's, there's temperature, there's, there's forces, there's, you know, tactile or the haptics um, that you feel. And I think that's really um, not just for simulation, but also for therapeutics that this is truly an immersive opportunity, not just the visual experience. Absolutely. No, I think, they, they, again, the possibilities are, I, I, I say always, only limited by how creative we are. And, uh, you know, you've shown thousands of, of examples of, of uh, therapeutic VR. But, but imagine when we use this AR or MXR uh, to do therapy on a patient, how, how uh, like, if you don't have to focus on the EMR in the computer or in the laptop, but you can actually, you know, focus on the patient, the therapeutics, you know, from you to that patient are a, a, a augmented in, in ways that are hard to even, you know, define or, or even measure, right? So I think it's a continuum. We have so much a, 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 to, uh, to learn, but it's going so fast and it's so exciting that, that I just can't, uh, can't wait to get there, you know? Absolutely. Well, in the book, I talk about the beginning that when people think of VR, they often think of a gaming platform for you know, teenagers playing first person shooter games in their parents' basement or something. And, and it is that, I mean, VR is a gaming platform, um, but it's obviously so much more than that. I mean, VR is a way to affect human consciousness um, in many different ways. And it's also not just about the headset, because as I talk about in the introduction of the book, these headsets are going to become eyeglasses or they yeah. maybe even become contact lenses. And you talked about that. I mean, it's not even about the headset. It, it could be presented in so many different ways. I mean, what are your thoughts about, you know, where we're, when are we gonna start using contact lenses in the hospital that, show, that project the health record right onto our eyeballs? Well, I, I definitely think that uh, it will happen at some point. We're still pretty early. You know, that company I mentioned is in with, and uh, they have the only patent uh, to put circuits on a hydrogel, just like the one we use for contact lenses, right? I, I think it'll be probably, you know, more than 10 years for that to happen. But I certainly know that glasses like this, this will uh, seem bulky, you know, in three to five years from now. We're going to have regular glasses like the, the ones you're you are you're using right now, which will be reading glasses, but will also be sort of intuitively and in, in, in instantaneously a, a, a tools to allow you to connect with the digital world outside or inside of the hospital. So I think that we're, you know, I talked about Mara's law, right? And again, we, we, uh, we tend to, to, uh, to, uh, to not understand how, how technology progresses, right? Uh, we, we overestimate it in the short term and we underestimate it in the long term. In the long term, we're going to have these technologies. We're going to have, you know, just like having our smartphones. Remember, you know, we were carrying those, those big brick phones and we were, oh, who's that guy? He needs to have a phone, you know, next to him or to her, you know, 24-7. And now we have one, two or three of these in our pockets, right? So it, it is a, a something that, that we, we don't even think about. But we're going to get there and it's going to be so quickly that uh, it will be amazing. And, you know, when we think about how, how we train the next generations, uh, they're going to have to, 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 to know about this when they are studying not you know when they finish their residencies yeah yeah 
Well, I want to thank you again, Raphael, for, for joining us uh, today for this event and for sharing your enthusiasm and your gadgets and devices and your vision for the future. Uh, hopefully people take away from this discussion that the future is bright. And uh, you know, if we're thoughtful about how to integrate this technology with the very human art of being a doctor and being a patient, uh, sky's the limit. So thank you again for being with us today. My pleasure, Brenda. My pleasure. And again, congratulations for everything you're doing. It's amazing. Thanks so much. So next up, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Danielle Collins. Now, Danielle's career has spanned many different industries, including public relations, real estate, and social work. But her career trajectory really pivoted when she underwent a surgery for a life-threatening brain bleed in 2017. It was then that Danielle experienced the power of virtual reality uh, created by a company uh, called a Surgical Theater. Now this traumatic life event served as a catalyst that propelled her mission to ensure that all patients have access to medical AR and VR technology. And she is a proud founding member and chief experience officer for the Empower 360 Foundation, uh, which is transforming patient engagement by providing vital funds to facilitate access to the most advanced VR and AR medical technology, regardless of socioeconomic status. She holds a master's degree in clinical social work from the University of Maryland, with a concentration in employee assistance programs, uh, and a bachelor of journalism from the University of Georgia. She has an incredible story to tell, uh, and I tell part of her story uh, in chapter 10 of the book, but uh, even better to hear it directly from Danielle. So Danielle, thank you so much for being with us today, and uh, you've got the floor. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Spiegel. I am honored to be here today and to sh share my story with all of you, be it virtually. <laughs> and I'd like to start off my talk today by transporting you back to June 2017. In June, I had brain surgery for a ruptured AVM in my right temporal lobe. It was a condition I was actually born with and I knew nothing about my entire life until the day that it actually ruptured. So I invite you right now to watch a video with me that transports you back to my days as a patient so that you can actually experience my journey alongside me. On Monday, June 5th, 2017, I felt the worst headache of my life, like an ice pick driving through my skull. A CAT scan revealed a bleed in the side of my head, the size of a softball. The only option to stop the bleed was to have a craniotomy to remove it. Being completely out of control is terrifying. It's difficult to talk to patients about brain surgery because it's very abstract. We're combining delivering difficult news about a scary diagnosis with the additional fear of not knowing what to expect and not being able to understand what it is I'm explaining to them. When we show them the model, when they fly inside their own brain, they can see the structures, they can see the tumor, they can see the aneurysm. This device creates an experience for the patient where nothing is unknown anymore. Patients are looking for some hope. They're looking for a way to understand what's happening. What's made brain surgery historically pretty challenging is surgeons have to look at two-dimensional imaging and then in their mind's eye create a three-dimensional map of how they might approach the operation. We thought, you know what, we can intervene here and we can take MRI and CT scans and fuse them together in our software to create a virtual reconstruction and change the practice of medicine for the benefit of the family, the surgeon, and the institution. It is that person's anatomy VRalized. When I put on the goggles, my surgeon asked me if I was ready to fly. In the moments where they were telling me really terrifying things, I also felt a little bit of peace from the way that it was being presented. I was able to, in real time, see inside my brain. I was physically there with them, looking at exactly what they were trying to communicate.
The advantage that the virtual planning and rehearsal brings to our readiness for surgery is the ability to simulate multiple different approaches. In a real patient, we don't get to try that more than once. We only get one shot at it. In the virtual model, we can do two plans, three plans, five plans, and see which one is the best for the individual patient. You make the bone look a little more like bone, so it's not translucent at first. Now that I can see the frontal sinus, I'm planning it, you know, if I'm, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I was at the hospital in the ICU for 10 days, and I had two angiograms, two MRIs, two CAT scans, and a craniotomy. I think virtual reality will change the face of healthcare. I think in some ways it already has. People are demanding transparency. I think people deserve to be spoken to in a way that they can understand. It made me more grateful for each and every moment that we have. We experience life in three dimension. Why should our medical care be any different? So as you all witnessed in the video, this life experience changed everything about not only my career, my personal life, how I viewed healthcare, but it inspired me to dedicate my life to bringing this opportunity for other patients to have access to these same technologies. So as we go through these slides, I'm gonna explain a little bit more about the foundation in Power360 that is a direct result of this experience. So taking you back once again, these are just some highlights of the actual images from the time I was in the hospital. The image on the left is post-surgery. I think I was two days post-surgery and they had actually had to break my cheekbone and my jaw to cut into the bone. So you're seeing pretty significant swelling there. The image in top center shows the bleed and you can see if you've ever seen a black and white DICOM image, just the juxtaposition of how different and colorful and graphic the surgical theater scans were that I was able to see as a patient, even more so when I had the VR headset actually on and was able to get a 360 degree Superman view of my pathology. And the image in bottom center is actual real image of me using the headset as a patient in the hospital. And the image on the right, I quite frankly have no recollection of because I was still heavily sedated, but I was coming back from my brain surgery. And I think I was, yeah, I'm giving a, a thumbs up. So it went well, clearly I'm here today. So Empower360 was really birthed, like I said, out of my experience as a patient and recognizing that traditional methods of care, while wonderful and life-changing, also can be improved upon. And so Empower360 serves as a catalyst to allow patients worldwide to have access to these VR and AR technologies that are able to help in a myriad number of ways throughout the healthcare continuum. Our mission statement is that we exist to transform patient engagement by providing vital funds to facilitate access to the most advanced virtual and augmented reality, 360 degree medical technology, regardless of socioeconomic status. And we do that in a number of ways and we'll touch on that in a minute. One of the ways that we initially do this, which will be expanded upon a little bit later throughout the slides, is by providing grants. So whether they be institutional research or um, leadership grants, our sole mission and the basis of our mission is to encourage the use of VR and AR technology. We empower doctors and we actually endowed a chair at Hogue Hospital, um, Dr. Rob Lewis, because we recognized early on that the doctors are the ones who have the ability to really implement these technologies and create a quorum within a hospital system that shows leadership that these technologies not only benefit patient care, but they're needed, they're wanted, and there's ways to creatively come up with funding. We raise funds from visionary philanthropists, charitable foundations, and individual donors and corporations that support our mission. As of late, I will say that given COVID, this has been slightly more challenging. The nature of our work, um, albeit important, many would say that it doesn't directly relate to COVID and fighting the crisis at hand. I would challenge that because I think now more than ever, we're seeing mental health issues crop up. I think patients now more than ever are less willing to go to doctors and offices. And so now given the opportunity from home, we're able to try to implement these VR and AR technologies 
from remote locations now more so than ever before. We also are continuing to always look for strategic partnerships with companies and organizations who align with our mission and who are continuing to innovate medicine through the use of technology. So whether that's the Intels of the world or whether that's the HPs of the world, we're looking for and constantly are looking for ongoing strategic partners to help us in this mission, both philanthropically and as sound stage advice for moving forward and how to best implement our strategic mission. Perhaps most near and dear to my heart is the confluence of a patient community and building out really not only just a repository database of patient stories that patients would have access to, but also meeting these individuals and their families face to face, whether online in this season or in person, and just really understanding their stories and how VR and AR could have played such an instrumental role in their recovery or how it actually did. So for me, one of the greatest rewards has been meeting patients, hearing their stories, and then giving hope to those who follow in our path who could and will benefit from these technologies. Obviously, one of the greatest challenges for anyone working in this space right now is how do you, how do you build collective awareness among the masses for the fact that these technologies exist? And if you work in healthcare, chances are you've heard but if you're in the general public and you are facing a diagnosis like mine was with a ruptured AVM and you go in for a traditional black and white DICOM scan and you don't know because you've never heard that you could put on a VR headset and be transported into your brain to understand your pathology in a whole new way, then that's a problem. And we have some work to do there to create awareness. And we're always looking for partners, whether marketing partners or strategic partners who have influence um, with philanthropic individuals to create a more robust plan for how to tackle that. And obviously, core to our mission is to just promote innovation to elevate the entire standard of care across the healthcare continuum. You know, as a patient, I use VR in my hospital room, but after forming Empower360 Foundation, I've become keenly aware of how much more I could have used VR throughout my recovery, be it for physical therapy, be it for pain management post-surgery, be it for um, some of the PTSD that I experienced since this was an emergent condition. And it has inspired me to be able to, it's inspired me to be able to have a platform to not only talk about these things, but to pull together resources and funding to make the things that we talk about a reality. So just restating, we aim to make virtual and augmented reality technology a standard tool in the toolbox across the continuum of care. I think it's by no means something that will completely replace traditional medicine. And I think that's one of the biggest things that patients can really help doctors understand is that it's not that we're looking to replace traditional standards of care. We're looking to enhance them and augment them with things that could make our experience as patients that much better. So as I stated before, we do this in three different ways. We provide institutional grants, leadership grants, and research grants. We'll go into them a little bit more in depth now. So institutional grants, it's pretty self-explanatory, but we aim to empower nonprofit medical institutions with resources that enable them to subsidize costs for these innovative technologies. So this could include introducing VR and AR technology through the traditional grant, or it could follow institutions that have demonstrated a previous initiative where they have expanded their VR and AR capabilities and need to continue to build upon those currently in place programs. Our leadership grants like the one mentioned with Dr. Lewis at Hogue are really seeking to award individuals, doctors or others within the medical ecosphere who are promoting these technologies and empowering patients and empowering their institutions that they work for to build a more robust program. So we do this to offset some of the costs of onboarding the technologies. We also do this to offset some of the costs of actually implementing a larger program, be it at Hogue, you know, where they have deployed this across a number of disciplines throughout the hospital. It's actually pretty incredible what he's built there. And then lastly would be our research grant. And this is one that's 
really near and dear to my heart too, because I think to be able to push the boundaries and the lines of what's possible by further research is always inspiring and very rewarding to give to. So in this capacity, we would be giving grants to any one of the number of things listed below. And those are not, not just the full list, but it's not just limited to those, but it can extend beyond as well. But to prove not only the efficacy of these technologies, but also to explore new areas that maybe we haven't previously explored before. So I just wanna thank each of you today for allowing me to share my story with you and explain a little bit more about the Empower360 mission. I would invite you if you are eager to get involved, whether from an advisory standpoint or from a philanthropic standpoint, please reach out. I always love to make connections. And if you're a patient that has a story to tell, that's probably the thing that would most excite me. So I look forward to hearing from you and really look forward to our next guest speaker who's talking about the neuropsychology of VR, Dr. Atai Danovich. Thank you all so much for hearing me today and I look forward to meeting you all in person in the near future. Okay, thank you, Danielle, for that talk. And uh, uh, please know that we'll have more of Danielle uh, who will be on a panel uh, uh, later on in today's sessions. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be able to introduce the first panel of today's program uh, focused on neuropsychology of virtual reality and really um, immersive uh, technologies and therapeutics. Um, we are fortunate to have three outstanding experts um, in the field, all from the Los Angeles area. Uh, the first is, is Judy Pa. Uh, who's a PhD. Judy is a cognitive neuroscientist and associate professor at USC in the Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute in the departments of neurology, neuroscience, and biomedical engineering. Um, she has extensive experience uh, with human neuroimaging and has a research lab that's specifically focused on Alzheimer's uh, risk factors and, and prevention. Um, her primary goals are to develop and test um, uh, novel lifestyle interventions, particularly ones using technology. Um, her research is supported by NIH. Uh, she recently received a large grant uh, to investigate the effects of uh, physical and cognitive activity intervention via virtual reality in older adults. And uh, uh, we look forward to her contributions on this panel. Uh, next, we have Dr. Skip Rizzo, um, also PhD. Uh, Skip is a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist and professor at the USC Department of Psychiatry and Davis School of Gerontology. Uh, he directs medical VR at the USC Institute for Creative Technologies and has conducted and continues to conduct research on the design, um, development, and evaluation of virtual reality systems in really every single domain of uh, psychological, cognitive, and, and motor functioning in, in healthy populations and clinical populations such as PTSD, TBI, autism, ADHD, um, Alzheimer's disease, and the list goes on. Um, Skip, has, his, his work to the field has been uh, really fundamental. He's been one of the, the, the founders of this field and has been recognized with many different recognitions and awards. A pleasure to have Skip on the panel. And, uh, and, and finally, we have Nantia Sutana, another PhD assistant professor in residence at the UCLA Department of Neurosurgery. Um, uh, Nantia's research aims to develop therapeutic cognitive treatments and tools through the characterization of neuronal mechanisms that underlie human learning and memory. And specifically, she uses virtual reality um, or augmented reality combined with wearable technologies and patients with brain implants to understand cognitive function and uh, develop novel therapies for neurologic and psychiatric disorders. So um, uh, really an outstanding group of individuals doing a, a very interesting work in this field. Um, perhaps to get started, uh, I would just ask each of you to describe how you're currently using virtual reality um, in your work. And, and really specifically, uh, there are so many tools, so many assessment tools and so many intervention tools in neuropsychology. What, what uniquely and specifically does virtual reality in, enable you to, 
uh, evaluate or do with your patients. Perhaps you can start with, uh, with you, Judy. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks for that really kind introduction. I'm happy to be here today. So my lab is focused on Alzheimer's prevention. And so we try to think about that in creative ways. As we all know, it's a terrible problem and we know we don't currently have any effective treatments. So what we're actively testing in my lab is um, a design that marries virtual reality with what we know about neuroscience. So it's an in-lab design of physical and cognitive training using virtual reality, being able to design a paradigm that we can't really do in the world. We can't safely take older adults who are worried about their brains or thinking and tell them to go out and navigate the world that they don't know. But we can do that in virtual reality. We can create these really interesting paradigms that they can bike through. Right now we're working with um, some urban parks and some atriums. And this is deliberate. We're trying to take physical activity and cognitive activity and put them together so that we can leverage the benefits in the brain of physical activity. So for a long time, we thought we were born with all the neurons we'd ever have. It's called neurogenesis. We now know that we actually grow new neurons or birth new neurons, and that physical activity accelerates that. What we are now layering on top of that with virtual reality is the cognitive component, that if you take these newly birthed neurons that are birthed in the memory center of the brain, the hippocampus, then you can actually help those neurons exercise their way outside of the hippocampus and to other regions within the hippocampus to help form those memories and to help those memories become more long lasting. And as we know within Alzheimer's disease, that's what we wanna hold on to is, is our memories, it's our thinking, it's our ability to be able to walk into a room and know why we went there. It's our, our ability to be able to um, drive in our neighborhood that we've lived in for 30, 40, 50 years and still remember how to get home. And so that's what VR has enabled for us is to us to get creative, to figure out, well, how can we challenge the brain in a safe mm -hmm. Terrific. Nantia, can you tell us about your work? Sure. Hi, everyone. So we uh, are using virtual reality to also uh, understand memory. So we use it as a tool to activate the brain and we work with patients who have implants in the hippocampus and other areas to see what's happening in the brain when we form new memories, recall those memories. There's so much we don't understand. The neuropsychological neuropsycho tools we have now or traditionally been using have flaws in how they assess, you know, this very complex behavior. So we're using VR and, and AR to, to really try to simulate these ex real realistic experiences so that we can better understand the brain. And then on top of that, we're also through collaborations, working on other disorders, PTSD, OCD, these, these sorts of things to try to not only understand what's happening in the brain, but also use it as a way to know when's the right time to engage with a treatment. And in, in, my, in my lab, the treatment that we use is deep brain stimulation, which is a, an area that is growing uh, quite quickly right now for treating neuropsychiatric disorders. And so using VR to try to assess you know, when, when's a good or bad time to intervene and can that therapy actually translate to the real, real world uh, by simulating it in the lab with VR. Very interesting. I look forward to return back to some of that. But uh, lastly, uh, let me turn things over to Skip to tell us a little bit about your work in VR currently. Well, my work originally began uh, in the mid-90s, and it was spurred on by my clinical work in brain injury rehabilitation. I did a lot of cognitive re rehabilitation from uh, the mid-80s to the mid-90s, and I was very frustrated with the tools we had available to us, a lot of paper and pencil, workbook-type exercises. And I started to notice that a number of my clients uh, who I couldn't engage with that type of activity would engage with Game Boys or with uh, video games. Uh, I actually brought in SimCity into the clinic, which at the time was uh, really a good executive function stimulation activity. But around that time, I started to see that VR was um, becoming something that was possible, as primitive as it was then. And the vision really was a combination of my background in neuropsychology, which is defined as the study of brain behavior relationships, um, but also my work with OTs, where there was a focus on, you know, the, not just measuring performance on a test, but how does somebody actually translate this to the real world? And I always saw VR from that point on as sort of a, a nice merger between 
neuropsychological rehabilitation and an OT perspective where you could, in a simulated environment, do the kinds of neuropsych informed drill and practice activities in a controlled environment, but do it within the context of a functionally relevant environment. And hopefully, from a clinical perspective, enhance the transfer of training or the generalization to the real world. So when I came to USC, uh, one of the first projects we did was with mental rotation. It was, you know, using blocks in a 3D environment. It was something we could do quite well with the primitive technology and computer graphics of the day. We got really good results showing that we could actually change uh, cognitive function with repeated practice in an interactive 3D environment. Went on to uh, virtual classrooms for testing kids with attention deficit under a range of controllable conditions. Did work with the military, putting people in military relevant contexts and testing their attention, memory, executive function um, in, the, in those ways. And all this work has grown and evolved. And probably the one that I'm most excited about now is actually outside of USC, uh, working with a private company that's taken the virtual classroom concept and now evolved it into something that could be a product in the near future uh, where we put a child in a virtual classroom. They have to perform a task. It's delivered visually on a whiteboard at the front of the class or um, <clears throat> auditory tasks that are embedded from the teacher or the screen, but we can systematically this context. So we can leverage with VR headset technology whether the child is looking at the whiteboard and missing a target or is a distraction like a bus going by a window, school bus going by, are they looking out the window and missing, it's not even in their field of view. This offers the capability for what VR is great at, um, this capacity to be able to detect, is this a distraction error? Is this a loss of focus error? Is it a hyperactivity error because the sensors and tracking technology and the headset allow us to pick up motor movement. Uh, and so that's where I, I really see VR shining is both in assessment and in rehabilitation, much like, and you hear, probably heard me say this a million times, much like an aircraft simulator can test and train piloting ability, we can test, train, teach, and treat human function in similar types of simulated environments, but we can do them on, you know, low cost, low cost uh, VR headsets like I have here, you know, Oculus Quest and so forth um, at, a, at a price point that is reasonable for clinicians to implement. So I'm, I'm really focused on getting this out of the lab and getting it into the hands of clinicians for everyday work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Judy, you, you talked about using uh, virtual reality to help um, uh, facilitate restoration or preservation of memory function. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a, a bit more about how that actually works and, and what that means in practice? Yeah, so, so there's different ways to think about it, right? So within normal aging, we all know as, as we age that we start to become a little bit more forgetful. We um, have some what we call word finding difficulty. What was that word I was looking for? Or maybe recently meeting somebody and not remembering their name, but remembering maybe some facts about them. Like, oh yeah, they just went to their daughter's wedding. So we really try to target the part of the brain that's involved in memory. Um, it's, it's just something so core to who we are, right? We, we hear a lot of uh, patients come into the clinic and they bring a family member with them. And that's the most heartbreaking thing is, is that mom or dad or grandma no longer remembers them or, or forgot, forgot that their daughter was born. And so we try to hone in on memory because that is, is such a key part of what happens with aging and, and really seems to be selectively vulnerable in Alzheimer's disease. But it goes beyond that. And that's what VR has allowed us to do is to not just focus on memory, but focus on the networks in the brain that serve memory. And so we all know that, and this really touches upon what Skip said, that if you can't pay attention to something, you're not going to learn it. But is it because you didn't attend to it? Is it because you didn't allow that memory to get encoded? Or is it because there's actual, actually some fundamental problem in the, the circuitry of the brain that's involved in encoding or storing or retrieving that memory? And so we 
have really tried to, to focus in on the networks in the brain involved in attention and memory and how that changes as we age. And so we don't, we don't just look at people who have dementia, who are no, no longer able to remember their, their, ch their child's name, but it's just, it's um, what I call our garden variety older adults. Those who are concerned they might be concerned because they notice changes. They might be concerned because they have a family history. You know, I, I saw my mom go through it and now I'm really worried about myself. Or they may just want to stay really sharp. And so that's what's really nice about our paradigm in VR that we're now testing. We want to test to see if it works. We, we put a lot of um, time and thought with engineers and neuroscientists and neurologists to think about how to design it. But that's what this next phase is that we're moving into is to actually test its efficacy. Is it a treatment? Is it something that can actually help either maintain memory or as you were saying, restore memories? Um, I noticed these memory changes, but now after being in this VR paradigm in this program that you have for brain training, I feel like I remember things more. I, I, I feel a little bit more alive. And so that's what we're really trying to target is this gray period between normal aging, maybe some early mild cognitive impairment that folks have heard about or MCI, all the way to dementia because it's a continuum. And from my perspective, the earlier that we can intervene, the better because we don't wanna see mom or dad start to decline. We wanna see mom and dad stay as mom and dad. And, and when you plan to compare VR, um, are there specific brain training uh, programs that, uh, that are the gold standard and that you plan to compare it to? So um, what's, what's neat about our design and how we've thought about it is we're try really trying to look at these interactive or these synergistic effects between physical activity and cognitive activity. So we now know the Lan Lancet Neurology, one of the prime premier medical journals, has now come out with 13 arguably modifiable lifestyle factors. It's not, it's not um, reasonable to ask anybody to change 13 aspects of their life. But if we can target the key aspects, which I believe are physical activity and cognitive stimulation, in addition to, to managing vascular risk, I think if we can take the key ones that are probably the most problematic for, for the majority, right? So this starts to get into precision medicine one combination isn't going to fit everybody. And if there's 13 modifiable risk factors, well, maybe one, two, and three are good for somebody else, but four, five, and six are good for another person. But to try to impact as many people as, we've can't, as we can, we've tried to target physical activity and cognitive activity because we really understand from neuroscience what the impacts are on the brain. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's VR as a mechanism to adopt lifestyle interventions that have been demonstrated to be effective. It's, it's, that's the basis of it. That's the foundation. But it, there's so many added um, complexities and layers on top of that, that VR allow us to do, which is it's, it's, um, it's personalizable, right? You can adapt it depending on one's performance or age or their existing knowledge base. And then you can scale it. So, con you know, contrary to these plug and play packages, which just maybe do um, different types of training or different types of assessments, they're very regimented, right? And, and that's not a problem because they're built to be regimented in a certain way. They compare what we call normative values for a given age or a given gender or sex. But what VR allows you to do is the sky's the limit, right? You can design anything. So right now, um, our first world was to put somebody in a park and have them navigate around and there's certain spatial cues, things like, oh, I remember when I see that building, I turn right. What we're doing now is we're putting them underwater. We have a new environment where we're actually having them spatially navigate underwater, which, which comes with its own set of challenges. But we couldn't do that in real life. We're not going to take an older adult and throw some scuba gear on them and have them go underwater, but we can in VR. And what's neat about VR is it's so immersive. When people go in, they think they are underwater. And when the trial ends and you, you take the HMD or the head mounted device, you know, the VR headset off of their head, you kind of see like the, the surprise reaction every time, you know, it doesn't matter if it's their first time or their 20th time in VR, you get this surprise reaction and they, 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 they get brought back right to reality. And they're like, Oh no, I'm just in this like 10 by 10 room sitting here with this one researcher um, to get into COVID complications. Now, you know, we only have one-on-one -on -one because we want to minimize risk, but 
they, you know, take off their headsets and then they are back to reality, but they were so immersed. And, and so that's the neat thing is that you can, you get to be creative. I mean, there's a, a whole different dimension that you can tap into with VR. Great. Thank you. Um, Nantia, can you tell us a bit more about um, the specific application of uh, virtual reality and, and localization and uh, work around deep brain stimulation? Sure, yes. Yeah, we, we, um, we're using VR, like I said, as a tool to understand the function of the brain. There's a lot of overlap with the other panelists here too, which is nice. Uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is, and that maybe ties into a topic of interest here, is how do we evaluate these, you know, paradigms, these VR paradigms for eventual therapeutic, you know, treatment or guiding of the therapy. And so one thing that my lab is doing is to co combine, you know, objective outcome measures like from, from wearables. So we measure things like eye, eye tracking, eye movements, pupil size, respiration, heart rate, skin conductance, like basically you name it, anything that's out there, we have combined with this platform. And we're starting to learn a lot about not just, you know, the behavior, but all of these biological or physio physiological variables that are very informative to help us, helping us understand what's happening when people fail to remember something or remember something they don't want to remember, like in the case of PTSD. And so how, the, how can the, that, those biological or physiological variables also inform the treatment? So um, I think, you know, as was mentioned before, it's a, it's a way to immerse the, the participants, the subjects or patients in a way that we can't do like uh, with all these wearables well in the real world, but in a controlled environment in the lab uh, and allows us to really start to answer some of these fundamental questions about biology, about the brain that we don't understand. And we need to understand these things to go to the next step and treat. Uh, treat. Uh -huh. Can you give us a specific example? It's so abstract thinking okay, about so the integration. I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of PTSD, yeah. for instance. You know, these are patients that are so severe that nothing so far has worked for them. So surgery is an option now for them to have an implant to, you know, stimulate the brain when there are unwanted memories that are coming, coming to them. And so we don't, what we're trying to understand is what is the signal that predicts that psychological dissociation uh, when they hear fireworks, for instance, in 4th of July. And so, you know, how do we, how do we um, simulate that experience in the lab in a person that's maybe not as severely affected? I know Skip does a lot of this work to use VR to try to simulate that experience. And then what we are doing is recording from the brain signals and then heart rate, skin conductance, all these other things to give us, the, to give us insight as to when, when is the right time to intervene with the therapy? So when should we be stimulating the brain to prevent that psychological triggering of the trauma, triggering, you know, unwanted memory. So that's one example. Um, does that help? Yeah, yeah. So we have examples of the two poles, VR to prevent and VR to preserve uh, memories. Um, Skip, um, how have, you know, you, you mentioned your work having begun in the 90s. Um, how has VR evolved and and what sorts of things are you able to do now that uh, you know you might have only dreamed about a couple of days ago, decades ago? Uh, decades. <laughs> uh, well, you know, certainly the the quality of the experience, the user experience that we can deliver, uh, has evolved dramatically and at a much lower cost. Uh, uh, that first mental rotation application I developed it required a two hundred thousand dollar silicon graphics computer. Uh, $125,000 3D projection system, you know, for a simple mental rotation activity. We, we ended up building other visual spatial apps on it to justify, uh, you know, the cost, but it was just crazy. Now you can do this in a, uh, you know, some, well, many things you can do quite well on a standalone headset for $400. And so that is, that to me is um, what's going to be the area where we break down the barriers to adoption. Um, I, I know for, in fact, with, with, um, with Brennan's work, you know, in the old days for pain management in a hospital setting, you'd have to wheel around on a cart, a PC with a tethered headset that had limited field of view, crappy resolution, um, you know, uncomfortable, heavy headsets. Now you can walk around and 
a care provider can pull out of their back pocket a low cost headset and give it to a user. And, and to me, that is one of the key elements. I mean, the work, uh, the work that Trudy and Nath have, have presented here is at the core of what we need to be doing is studying the neuroscience and the brain behavior relationships that can guide us clinically. But all that clinical information isn't going to be of much value unless we have a way to deliver it <clears throat> at a low cost and in a way that's highly usable and with a headset that's not comfortable or that has graphics that are engaging and compelling and where we have a software infrastructure that allows us to systematically adjust the content um, very easily. You don't have to be a programmer to do that. So in all the areas over the last 20 years, you know, we've seen the enabling technologies all come together at the same point to where we are today, where the, the vision, the, 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 the technology caught up with the vision that we had way back then. We had all these ideas way back then, but we couldn't do it very well, and we couldn't do it in a cost-effective manner. And that is where the merger of you know, the real science and the clinical application is enabled. And how do you see looking forward at the next 10 years and recognizing that, you know, even we still use the term VR, though it's becoming outmoded as, as uh, there's all sorts of other forms of augmenting our experience of reality. Um, but how, how do you expect the technology to evolve and our, our use or, uh, you know, engagement with it to change? But real, I'll just add one real quick point and let uh, my other esteemed colleagues weigh in. But, uh, you know, I think with 5, 5G uh, connectivity, we're looking at a world where we can have in the cloud a giant library of all these different types of virtual environments that, you know, target different uh, processes and different clinical conditions and so forth. And a clinician can at will just click on one for a specific client, specific to their needs, and stream this content right down so that now the content delivery is no longer a bottleneck. Right now, there's 50 different companies that are all building different pieces of content. Are you going to license each one of those and, and try to manage it? I think it's, there's going to be an aggregation of content that's evidence-based, or at least there's some information about the level of evidence that supports the use of that content. So a clinician can make an informed decision and in how they want to use these tools with their clients that have different needs. Right. Great. And I, I apologize if you guys are getting some feedback uh, from, uh, uh, from my side of the platform. There's a uh, fire alarm, which I believe is a false alarm <laughs> going on. Let's hope. Um, all right. Um, uh, Judy and Nantia, can you uh, uh, share some of your ideas of how uh, uh, you see VR being used over the next decade? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I have that much more to add over what Skip said. My thought and my hope is really just that it becomes more affordable and more commonplace. And so right now, when you hear about VR and these headsets and we see these pictures, they look, um, you know, from another world and just it's not a part of our daily nomenclature, things that we consider. I hope that it, it will be because for me as a scientist, my goal is to develop and then test for efficacy these different types of interventions. And I want them to be able to easily be put in the hands of users or the people who can benefit. And so for my population, it's like I said, our garden variety older adults, those who wanna stay mentally stimulated, those who wanna get some more physical activity, but they can't get as motivated to get to the gym. But if they have a program at home and they have a VR headset at home and they can just put it on and maybe be able to bike together in the world and race and see who knows the right ways to turn and the wrong ways to turn and remembers the name of the dog, then that's a win to me if, if, it, if it proves in fact that our program is efficacious for maintaining brain health. And so for that to be able to happen, just, just like what Skip was saying, we need it to be accessible. We need it to be um, a device that somebody can carry around and, and pull out of their back pocket or mom and dad or grandma and grandpa can run down to Best Buy and pick up the headset with the built-in program and, and put it on and play it for a number of months and, and feel good. 
Was I turn uh, things over to you, Nathia, for a comment? Oh, yeah. I guess. I mean, I agree with everything that's said. I think that's the most important, what was just said. I would, I would just add to that, that I hope to see it incorporated more in the science, in the background, such that uh, more scientists are using it to help guide and develop these treatments. And I think one of the bottlenecks to that is hopefully, you know, like with developing a website, when we first, you know, started doing that, there's only certain people who can do that. And now today, anybody can really make their own website. So hopefully one day anybody could make their own VR content and test it out. And if that's some, if that's a world we're in where scientists and medical health care practitioners can do that more easily, we have more room to really test and develop all these innovative things and see which one is the best, which is the most effective. So that's my hope. I hope that happens. You know, it, it seemed to me as an, as an observer that, that, um, uh, and, and many others have commented uh, commented on this that, that, that the pace of development in 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 uh, this area has been really high over the last five years, and certainly the pace of um, research and of publications and of, of funded research has been growing. Um, during COVID, um, there's been acceleration of uh, virtual technologies to reach to, out to people. And, uh, and, and I'd imagine perhaps a, a change in recept, uh, receptivity. Um, I wonder what's been your experience of, of implementing any of this work um, uh, you know, during the pandemic that we've faced over the last six months? And are there any particular ways that you see this technology um, helping to bridge the divide that the pandemic has created and that is likely to be with us for at least the next six months? Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at the related field of telemedicine and teletherapy, um, certainly that was growing, but what's happened with COVID, it's a game changer and probably where we are now in accepting the use of teletherapy and telemedicine approaches uh, with patients and, and, and uh, care providers being, you know, remotely located, but still interacting. Uh, you know, in six months, it's gone where it probably would have taken two or three years uh, without COVID to be adopted and to be accepted and, and to be studied even more so now because it is going to be relevant long after, you know, the curve is flattened and vaccine is found and all that. I think we're going to see a wider adoption in that area. And I think it'll certainly be the same um, with VR. I think there's going to be certain beneficiaries in, in clinical applications uh, due to COVID. And one of the primary areas, uh, you know, relates to our work with the trauma with service members, military populations, PTSD exposure, and, and so on, but other methods as well. And that is going to be with frontline healthcare professionals that are being ground to a nub um, with the stress of COVID and all the challenges that it's presenting. And, you know, some of the early data out of China with healthcare providers, um, is, is frightening um, and that we've got, to, we've got to be able to address their needs, whether it's direct treatment for PTSD. I don't know if that, I'm sure there's a big segment of the population there, but other um, support applications, whether it's a mobile enabled virtual human coach or sensors using the wearables that were mentioned to be able to detect when somebody's having a difficult time. But all these areas, um, I think can be brought together to provide um, service for people that you know were really put through the ringer with COVID, and that you know that includes all of us, but particularly healthcare providers. Thinking you know, think about it as you know they're on the front lines of this combat, just like a service member is in in a war zone, um, and there's going to be follow-on consequences to that, and we've got to you know be anticipate and we've got to anticipate these challenges and develop um, things that might uh, might move the needle forward, leveraging the things we've learned from the combat context. Okay. I think that that is all the time that we have. Uh, it's unfortunate because there's many more questions to ask uh, each of you, and I feel like we've only scratched the, uh, the surface. Um, but uh, uh, we have many more things planned over the course of the day. And uh, for our next session, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Brandon and to Matthew to introduce um, our next uh, session. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
So uh, Dr. Danovich, thank you so much for that it's very stimulating panel on the neuropsychology of VR. Uh, so I'm uh, Brandon Burkett, Dr. Brandon Burkett at Cedar sinai I work in uh, the virtual reality clinical trials here at Cedar sinai and I also co-direct the Virtual Medicine Conference, which is now a webinar series. And so I have a fantastic patient panel here, co-moderated by uh, Matthew Stout, who is the CEO of Applied VR, pioneering uh, at-home chronic pain or pain use for virtual reality therapy, and uh, this fantastic panel of patients that I've gotten to know over the last few years. And so uh, I want to have all our, our panelists introduce themselves, but when you introduce yourself, please give the audience a little bit about how you were introduced to virtual reality and also your response to that experience. Uh, and um, take, take it away. Uh, let's start off with um, Tom. Uh, my name is Tom Norris. I'm a chronic pain uh, individual. I've had chronic pain for over 30 years. Uh, I was introduced to the uh, applied VR by Dr. Spiegel during one of our, uh, our, our sessions when we were talking about communication between chronic pain patients and doctors. Uh, I jumped at the chance to participate with applied VR in, in the VR program. Uh, I have uh, used the, the tenets, the basic ideas that the VR program uh, sponsors or reinforces for my entire life, ever since I learned how to read. And I have used this, those lessons, even without the VR hood, in chronic pain situations, in acute pain situations, in uh, depression, in uh, anxiety, in, in fear uh, circumstances. And it's always come through for me. Uh, as I tell people, the only time that uh, VR doesn't work for me are the, the, the tenets of concentration, breathing, and uh, uh, diverting one's attention is when I'm in a crisis. But any other time, it works great. Thank you. And then Amanda, would you give a, an intro to kind of your experience and a little bit about um, maybe why, why, why you needed to use VR at that time? Sure. Um, my name is Amanda Green. I'm also known as LA Lupus Lady. So I live in Southern California and I live with lupus and chronic pain. I recently, um, or the first time I tried on a headset was at a HIMSS conference, which is a health technology conference in Chicago. And I was exhausted after a day of being a patient advocate. And, you know, it was a huge conference days before the pandemic, 40,000 people, a lot of booths. And I was exhausted. I barely thought I could make it to my, the bus in my hotel room. And I saw an applied VR booth for the first time. And the video behind it featured a doctor from Cedar sinai who has now become my friend. And we all know Dr. Spiegel. And I, it's just incredible when I was exhausted, I put on the headset, I put down my bag and I was able to stand for about, I thought it was like two minutes. It was, I had a headset on for 10 minutes and I was out in nature and I swam with manatees and now I'm swimming with dolphins. And it, that was my first experience. And from there, when I took off the headset, I was, it was like having a burst of energy the pain from the day was gone and I had new energy. I was able to go network and all the cocktail parties that I thought I would be sleeping through. As a patient advocate, you have one opportunity that's a big conference like that and virtual reality saved the day, saved the night and changed my life. That was my first experience. Thank you. Definitely. Definitely. And, and Danielle? You know, heard a little bit, but I, I guess if there's any other thoughts you have or a quick intro in case maybe others didn't meet that fantastic talk you gave a little earlier. Thank you. I'm Danielle Collins, and I'm the Chief Experience Officer for Empower360 Foundation. But before that, I was and still am a patient advocate for VR and AR technology. I'm a recovering and still living AVM brain sur surgery survivor. And my first experience using VR was actually in my hospital room at George Washington University Hospital in DC. 
Uh, it was a company, Surgical Theater, that allowed me to fly through the pathology in my brain prior to my surgery to help me understand the surgical plan and the condition that I was facing. And I can say that I wish I would, after hearing your stories and the amount of pain that I have dealt with since my surgery, I may very quickly, Matthew, become an applied VR <laughs> advocate as well. Um, because I think what's so special about all of our journeys and that we'll discuss on this panel is just that it really does span the medical care continuum and that every patient has the opportunity to have some type of physical or emotional or um, intelligence in my, you know, in my case, it was um, knowing my pathology, the ability to have some type of experience for the better with VR or AR technology. Uh, so, so thanks for the introduction on everybody. And, you know, for us at Applied VR, we always think first and foremost about the patient, right? Because that's what, that's why we're doing this, at least on the therapeutic side of this. And one thing that I noticed as each of you were talking, one word came to mind for all of this, empowerment that each of you talked a little bit about a story of how this has helped empower you. Tom talked about the empowerment for him to be able, when he's out of the goggles, uh, for him to reflect back on that and use that to help him get through. Danielle talked about when she was going, for prepping for surgery. It empowered her to have more knowledge and insight into what was actually gonna happen to her uh, when they were gonna go and do the brain surgery. And the same thing with Amanda. Uh, so it's, it's great to hear that. When, uh, when, when we think about uh, developing this, you know, the, the science around this all started around acute pain. But one thing that I would love to hear, and you know, first and foremost from Tom and Amanda, we'd love to hear a little bit about that. There's a question around durability. How long does it last? Because obviously people can't live their life in the headsets. And so, you know, from your experience, is this something that, you know, after you do uh, a session, does it last for 10 minutes? half an hour, an hour, a day, just kind of what your, what your experience is around that. And you wanna start with Amanda? Um, I'd be happy to. As you know, I was exhausted. It was 4.30 Chicago time and I didn't get back to my hotel room until after midnight. So at, I would say at 4.15 before I donned the goggles, my plan was to go to the hotel room and nap. And just my first experience had a more than eight hour effect. So cumulatively, I mean, I, that was my first time. I have used VR when I have bouts of more acute chronic pain. Like it, it's, it's, it's so bad, where's my headset? And then once my headset's out, like, you know, then it becomes, oh, I have this tool that I should not ever put away. It just needs to be there, part of my toolkit, part, part of, uh, a plan. It's not going to be the be all end all. But when I put on the headset, I do use less medication. I mean, I, I feel like I'm repeating, you know, stuff I've said before, it's like I use, act, you know, less medication that has physical side effects, the side effect from a virtual headset diaphragmatic breathing session for me is I'm more relaxed, I'm less anxious, I mean, let I'm less, I'm in more, I'm more empowered and in control of my body, which can trigger my pain, my neuro pain pathways. And I'm, you know, I'm not the doctor, I'm, I'm patient perspective, but I'm in control of my body. I can, I know how to breathe when the headset's not on me because of the lessons and the training that I have received and been reminded of when the headset is on. Right. So right. long after I, I might keep going like days after it's like, I, sometimes I'll just look at the headset and then I'll, I won't even have to put it on and I'll just breathe. Right. And it's great to hear that. Yeah. Uh, Tom? I think I'm a probably a, a, a different case. I've been, as I said, I've been using the the basic principles that apply VR and virtual reality that, that I've been using reinforces my entire life. And, and that knowledge has gotten me through. I use the, the hood as a, a, a booster, a charge uh, to reinforce when I feel like I might be weak. So I can go months without using the hood. Uh, when when I, I really need it, and it really depends on situations with, you know, whether it's uh, the stress of the pandemic or, or really acute pain from a, a bladder operation or whatever, then I'll pull out the hood and, I really, I go through the sessions 
and then I'm good for as long as it takes. It, it really, I think you're going to find out through study that it depends on the individual. And, and for me, it goes with the level of my positive thinking, the level of my being able to visualize and, 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 and have a strong body-mind connection. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I, I think what you tap into is that it's not necessarily a one size fits all. And that's something, I, you know, in the studies that Cedar sinai has done, you know, when they were able to actually provide a, a variety of different experiences, especially in the acute pain setting, that they would, different people respond to different things. And I think we as an industry on the development side, you know, we're always looking for more and more data to figure out how is it that we can actually deliver, some people will say personalized VR, we call it precision VR, where it's actually mapped directly to you as an individual for the, for the needs that you have. So. Yeah, and I actually, I have a comment and then a question for Danielle and a comment about kind of this, this, this uh, spectrum. Uh, what we're thinking about at Cedars is, is trying to find these phenotypes of essentially, you know, is it possibly that immersion or that sense of presence may be factoring in how long someone may be having that effect after VR. And so potentially, you know, if we took something like a scale like immersive tendency questionnaires or a presence scale, you know, we may potentially see uh, a spectrum of individuals, say from Tom to Amanda, and maybe there is a spectrum difference there or some other patient level demographics. Uh, and so likely our next couple studies are going to hopefully try to see if there is this, this uh, you know, some, some measures that can predict this tail effect of VR lasting longer than you know, several minutes to, to even hours um, and, or longer after a session. We did see that in the acute and patient unit. Now we just want to try to better profile that, like you said, Matthew, for precision VR. So for Danielle, I, you know, the educational side of VR is not my area of expertise, but I'm interested to hear from your perspective and all the individuals that you talk to about kind of the immersion and that empathy factor. Is, is there also um, any type of uh, effect of differences between individuals you've met that have used VR kind of in a medical education space uh, and, and their responses as we've seen variations in, in the people that you talk to? So I think one of the most powerful examples of that is empathy building through training specifically with whether that's providers or whether that's um, family members to understand a patient's perspective. I think that that is one of the most powerful uses that still has a way to be studied in VR. Um, along that same line, what another, it begs to question another thing I, I'm reminded of, you know, when you think of a workout, for example, a HIIT workout, it's really intense and you're in there and then you have the afterburn effect versus a long steady state workout and you don't get as much of the afterburn effect. So in correlating that to what we're talking about here in VR, I'm wondering too about the actual content that we're looking at. And I would be curious <clears throat> further studies about the immersiveness of the actual content, which is something Empower360 is currently exploring, is if there's more real life and as hardware continues to develop and we're talking about 8K resolution, will that also then impact patients' care potentially in the future because it will feel more realistic and therefore more immersive? Uh, so Daniel, it's interesting you talk about that. There's, uh, there's this thing called the uncanny valley, which uh, you may have come across, which is and a good example of this is the Polar Express, which is a, uh, an animated uh, film from probably 15 years ago, right? And at one point, uh, it was so close to being real, but it wasn't exactly real that mm -hmm. people couldn't, they had a hard time processing it, oh, yeah, right? Because right. they said the animation, they can just let go, they know it's not supposed to be real, so they let go of it and they can totally let themselves get engaged in the story. In the reality, right, you can get in there and it is real, so you don't, your brain doesn't think something's a kilter. In that uncanny valley, and that's, that's the toughest thing, that uh, is, is how do you draw the line? And, and what would also be interesting in those lines is, we've seen studies in the past that, that showed it's not necessarily about reality versus animation. It's mm -hmm. just, I think it's as much storytelling as it is uh, the actual, uh, the, the quality of the video content itself. Right. And, uh, and, and that's how you, I think, really think you build engagement at the end of the day. But I do, but I do believe as we go, the technology gets better as the um, uh, internet speeds get faster, then you're going to be able to start to do more of that, that real time or, or real video. And we can start to do exploration around that. Absolutely. And I, I love what you said too, um, just to follow up on the storytelling piece, because I think each one of us has a story. They're all individual and 
different on some degree, um, what we experienced in our individual experiences with the technology, but that storytelling piece combined with the immersive component of the hardware and, you know, the, um, the actual images as we progress in the future. Yeah. I'm so excited to see where that takes us. Yeah, you, you and me both, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so I have a question for all three of you. So, as, you know, given your experiences with VR, and, and you know, many of you are, are quote heavy users of VR, would love to know what you think it's missing right now from a patient perspective. How do you think we can actually improve the experience? Think about this both from a content perspective, from a, a hardware perspective. Uh, we'd love to hear your perspectives on that. And, and why don't we uh, go back around the horn? We'll start with Danielle. Okay, so first and foremost, I think the kiosk aspect of any type of VR application is paramount, especially if you're in an inpatient setting or be it at home, quite frankly, for that matter. Um, the ability to onboard a patient quickly to have them understand exactly how to use the technology, just ease of use. Not only does it expand the range of the individuals that you're able to treat, but for some who may, um, you know, be dealing with more chronic pain and they just, they just, they don't have the time or the bandwidth to sit there and not have a kiosk in version of the therapeutic. So that would be first and foremost, what would come to mind. And then I think um, just access and awareness. I mean, building out a platform where we are continuing to market and build public awareness for these technologies will allow more patients to use them and realize that it is an affordable option for patients to use. Um, and hopefully payers and providers will also get on board as well. <laughs> Great, thanks for that. Uh, Amanda. I'm glad you asked this question. Um, and I don't know if anybody has read Brendan Spiegel's book yet, but there's a chapter called The Virtual Pharmacy. And if you've been to a virtual medicine conference, you know what it is, where we're all unique. And you know, as three patients, we might have three different preferences of content. As somebody who lives in California, I like water. I want to see more content about like a walk on the beach. You know, I like the water. I like nature videos. I whether it's animated or actual. Um, there's lots of content that I like that is available on YouTube now that I'm like, oh my god, that would be cool. Like for fashion shows that are streaming, to put on a headset and see not just the fashions that are walking down, like for an example of a content that I might like that maybe Tom probably doesn't want to see a fashion show, but it just for the pain patient that it has to be improving access and making the headset accessible and it is i mean to me I'm applied vr health the pain care vr system it, it's affordable it, it's priced maybe you're exposed to it in the hospital but when you realize how good it works you want to take it home with you and whoa you can't i have one at home when people have seen it other patients have bought they're like, it's that easy and it's that it's that life-changing that when you think about the cost benefit analysis, rather than the cost of pain and the quality of my life, it's worth it. So obviously lowering the cost would be better. Hey, give out free ones. I, I mean, to, obviously to improve pain, you, you need more access. We, we need, it's not, doesn't really need to be easier to use. To me, it's very easy to use. You put on the headset, and when you take it off, you make sure it's charged. So when you need it again, it's ready to go. Yeah. Right. So I just want to thank you for that. And I would just say expand the virtual pharmacy with content. Like for me, I was, you know, I'm a cat person, but I know the people like, I want to see, I want to see somebody like virtually walk their dog on the beach, like put on a headset when I, when I'm unable to walk or if, you know, or basically like if I can stand up and do a kiosk setting, like walk with them. If, if yeah. I'm in, I mean, it depends on the level of pain I'm at if I'm sitting or right. standing. Yeah. But there's just so much that I think applied VR is just beginning to help patients. And yeah. I, I'm and glad I'm, to be a part of it. And I thank, well, thank you for that. And I do think this is more of an, of an industry thing from the therapeutic development side, right? It's not just about applied VR, but it's about you know, all of the companies that are getting into this space. So, I can only speak from my experience. Yeah, yeah no, so was, which is great. We, is yeah, we, which we obviously appreciate and love. Um, but, and, and you're right, it goes back to what Danielle said is, how can we do more advocacy for the industry as a whole and to bring more awareness and uh, to ultimately get the, the payers on board because that's how you're going to create the, the biggest accessibility here is to get the payers to start. To but there, has to be, there has to be a direct link, proven link yeah. to ROI for the hospital yeah. budget. And at that point, I can do this now. 
<laughs> I mean, range of motion, my quality of life. I mean, there, there's videos of me on um, voice. Uh, I, I've been a virtual medicine advocate for as long as I've put on the headset. And I've actually shared my story on Voices of America. And it was over a year ago. And I recently, you know, I shared the video. And I looked at it. I'm like, whoa, I didn't realize that virtual reality has helped me. Been, I've been in less pain, which has helped me move more which I've actually lost. I've been able to physically feel better. And then when I had an emotional painful experience due to the pandemic, that the chronic pain tool that I have used for my physical pain actually helped me, you know, it didn't take away the pain, but like I've said before, it made me just breathe and be in the moment. And that empowered me to you know, get through my grief and move through through that with emotional pain, as well as the physical pain of, you know, a, a procedure that I had, the, the a PRP procedure I had in both ankles. So it, it was just conducive to my healing and less pain, which is, yeah. you know, thank you. Great. Uh, Tom, I wanted to make sure we, uh, we get your perspective on this. Sure. Uh, you know, to make it short and sweet, uh, a, a, dramatic increase in the availability of a variety of programs in VR. But, but I have to say that, you know, I, I run a support group or actually two support groups right now under the American Chronic Pain Association. And every one of my group members uh, calls me Mr. VR because I'm always pushing the VR. I, I, I brought the hood that, that Brandon lent me to meetings and it, it's amazing to me that once the the device is available and somebody has five minutes to use it, that how much a person can change. I, I, I One particular instance, I had an individual who was very, very depressed. She put the hood on and within five minutes she was laughing. Now she was doing the, the, the bear game. So, you know, it, that's understandable, but we really need to be able to to get some variety of, of the, the VR hood out to everybody. And I think about, I, I'm from Virginia in a very rural county. And I think about the people I know there with chronic pain, who I have talked to about the hood, who quote, can't afford it, doesn't believe in it. And I say, you know, you really got to try. I, I think it's going to take a concerted effort to, to put this thing on the road so it reaches out to people. And in a way, I guess the pandemic is a good thing because we're doing more telemedicine and, and this falls right in line with telemedicine. So that that's my two cents short and sweet. So Tom, I got a quick question for you. You talked about community and uh, the support groups that, you're, that you've been working with. Have those traditionally, have those been in person? Have those been online? I, I have for I've done support groups uh, with uh, each group is probably about twelve people face to face for thirty years, and now I've taken all those to uh, Zoom calls. It's yeah. all virtual now. Yeah, one of the areas that we look at is especially as you're thinking about isolation, both obviously mm -hmm. from that's driven by this pandemic, and then just in the aging population, there is an increasing isolationism that, that's occurring. Uh, the uh, you know the p potential for using VR to create those connections, uh, we think is also a very interesting area. And, and you know, offline, we'll love to chat with you a little bit more about your experiences and share with you some sure. things that we're doing around that. One other thing is I do a, uh, an old folks like, not, I, I am an old folk. So I do a, a support group for the elderly every Thursday, in fact, one this afternoon. And that that's gonna be a hard nut to crack because a lot of, uh, us elderly have vision problems and I don't know how we're going to get VR to them to the point where they can actually use it and, and do more than listen. But, but I think that's a great market. So it's open and I'd be willing to talk anytime. Uh, and if you believe Elon Musk, then we'll all be having a chip in our brain soon enough. That's and it. then we don't even need to have the goggles. <laughs> that's <laughs> it. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> One, uh, yeah, I'll tell you one thing that uh, Danielle brought up was uh, the ease of use. And we talk about this from a design perspective about the three E's. 
uh, if you really are going to drive this efficacy, obviously, is, is your ticket to entry to all of this stuff. But if you're going to drive usage and adherence and compliance, uh, it's got to be first and foremost easy to use. Because if it's complicated, I don't care how efficacious it is, no one's ever going to, the pr practitioners aren't going to want to deal with it and the patients aren't going to want to deal with it. And so that's our, you know, the number one design principle we think about and we encourage everyone that's working in this area to think about. And then obviously the second piece of that is engagement. If you can think about how do you continue to engage that person? Uh, Danielle, you referenced this in the notion from the idea of immersion. How can you get them more and more ensconced into this that they want to come back into it? Because you know we're Americans, we, we like the easy way out sometimes. Just give me a pill. We need to make this easier than a pill or at least more enjoyable than taking a pill. Mm -hmm. And so that engagement, if you get the first two, then the effectiveness is the 30, then uh, obviously we think that that just comes with it. Mm -hmm. So um, and the other thing we, we think about is the headset right now has always been the barrier. So it's, you know, VR has been around for 30 plus years. It, originally, there was just this big, massive machine tethered to big, uh, big computers, cost $50,000 and lived in the laboratory where people said, oh, isn't that interesting? And I feel like right now we're just that basically we're barely at version 1.0 of, of what the headset is going to be. And, and we're excited about how this is going to ultimately, um, uh, the headset, headset's going to transform and become smaller and smaller and easier and easier to use. So mm -hmm. it becomes a part of every, everybody's just daily life. Mm -hmm. Much like the cell phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. That's what I we're looking VR, for. VR has yet to have its iPhone moment. And I think that in the future, um, in the not so distant future, it will. Well, let's, I think Tim Cook is, has something to say about that as uh, we're waiting for what Apple's going to do in this space. Right. Uh, Get some glasses. We, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> It'll be That's fascinating. Yeah. No, I actually think just to tie it in, that, that is interesting because um, we, uh, we had a, a talk earlier on uh, from Raphael about the future of VR. And he actually talks a little bit about the glasses and even contacts. Um, so um, yeah, I'm interested to see kind of the first um, contact or, or, or glasses, you know, whether these are a bit large, kind of like the first VR headsets were, were a bit, bit large and cumbersome. I think that's probably why Facebook has it as a research project right now for some of their glasses, but still, I mean, it's a lot of improvement there. Um, yeah. So. Any other questions? We've got a couple more uh, minutes. I was just gonna, um, close it out in, the, uh, uh, in about three minutes, but is there any other questions we want to cover? Well, it would be great to get just kind of the, the last uh, closing perspectives from, from each of our uh, panelists here today. And uh, okay. if you could, you know, we'll, we'll, we're gonna let you play uh, designer. We're gonna let you play futurist in this. So if you were to look ahead five years from now and say, what do you believe the state of uh, VR therapeutics is gonna be? or your wish that it would be, what would that be? And let's start with Tom on this. Gee, thanks, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> well, I, as, as a disclaimer, I have to say that I'm, I'm a science fiction addict. I would, initially, I would think that we wind up being, uh, well, to, to draw a video uh, a reference would be like uh, Ready Player One, where it's the entire body uh, sensation is incorporated into the VR. Uh, in fact, well, let's go all the way and say the, the day that we can put ourselves into a, an environment like Ready Player One, I think would be amazing and fantastic. I would love it personally. <laughs> That's Great. short and sweet. Perfect. Uh, Amanda. Um, I think Ready Player One's a few more years away, but ideally, I think every rheumatologist waiting room, if, the, if we go back to the traditional waiting rooms, should just have a VR headset and say, try it. And, and I mean, obviously sanitize the wipes and in between use, but if, if you're given the chance to try it for five, 10 minutes, that's the best way. Engagement to empower, engagement raises awareness and then that leads to the empowerment of like wow this is a pain tool that i didn't even think about and it can change your life right uh danielle okay i have spent many months thinking about this actually so i feel like i'm cheating but for inpatient settings i see in lieu of a tv i see every patient a hospital bed having a vr headset next to it with a with a library of content specific to your pathology or specific to your condition. 
that you're able to access in your hospital room. Now, given the pandemic and what our future may look like, I also see that being where telemedicine will have a component where you will be sent a headset in a prepackaged box at home and agnostic to any company per se, you would not only be able to do your virtual consult with your provider through that headset, so it feels like you're in the room with them at the hospital, but from your home, you would be able to be prescribed your therapeutic alongside in that same headset remotely from home. Have you been looking at our product roadmap here? No. Did you say that? What? <laughs> but if you're yeah. on the same page, we should talk because I think that's where. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's great. So, yeah. um, I guess with that, I'm going to close it out and say this was a fantastic panel talking about the future, the present, everyone's experiences. It's just been great to hear. And so I'm going to uh, kick it over to Dr. Spiegel for closing remarks. And, and thank you so much, uh, Matthew, for being co-moderator and, and the panelists. Thank you so thank much. You. Great. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks again. Well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you for that outstanding and, again, extremely insightful uh, panel discussion. It's a tremendous end to what has been a really exciting and informative webinar uh, today. So, you know, what's, what have we learned today in these last couple hours? Well, you know, the big idea of medical extended reality is that it can leverage our power to imagine when we need it the most. VR modifies our reality in, in ways that may be hard to accomplish in times of great vulnerability and distress. By carefully adjusting our virtual reality when we're sick, we can affect our physical reality for the better. VR does this in many different ways as we've learned today. VR can radically change our perspective of the world. We can imagine being somewhere fantastical and healing we can practice being the person that we want to become. We can see ourselves from beyond, sometimes literally, like in my out-of-body experience. We can regard ourselves in a new light in virtual reality. We can confront our inner voice. We can transform our minds dramatically, and in some cases, even immediately. And when it's effective, we can forge healthy cognitions that last long after the headsets are removed. Now we already have these abilities within us, but VR just makes it easier when times are hard. So with that, I hope this was a helpful seminar this morning and that you've learned something uh, novel. And if you wanna learn more about this, again, I encourage you to pick up uh, the book VRX. And with that, on behalf of all of our supporters, Cedar sinai Medical Center, uh, our virtual medicine program at Cedar sinai Applied VR and Confidio, I wanna thank you for tuning in today and wish you a good rest of the day. Thanks and be well. <laughs>